This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. If you can change your thinking, you change your life. That's what happens when you come to church. It's what happens when you come to Bible study. That's what happens when you're committed to a study of God's Word. It changes the way you think, and then your life changes. You're not thinking like that anymore. And when you change the way you think, you change the way you believe. And when you change the way you believe, because you change the way you think, because you're changing what you're exposing yourself to, man, your life changes. Your life changes, man. You do things differently. But it starts, it starts right here. It starts right here. And in your mind, Never go back to that way of thinking. I want you to look at your life, your family, your friendships, your job, your hobbies, every single piece that makes up your life, God cares about it. And I'm on a mission to show you how to take back the victory in all those pieces, how every single piece of your life is covered under this grace. So join me July 6th through the 10th for Grace Life 2020. Register now at CreflodollarMinistries.org. And remember, no peace left behind. This is your world. So let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know. You love the city A lot of times when people go through real crazy stuff, it's because they keep flirting with their past. It's time to leave it. Excuse my English, but that ain't you no more. <laughs> Quit flirting with the old you, the new you trying to stand up and take you to that place of the high call. Man, I'm going to get myself an offering. I ain't got nothing. I'm doing everything electronically. I'm going to send something to myself. Amen. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? So if you say, okay, from this day forward, I'm not going to eat such and such anymore, then, then don't eat it anymore. Don't say, oh, but I just can't help myself. I got to have that sugar. No, don't eat it. Don't go back. Don't go back. I've seen people get in, into adultery and destroy their families because they've gotten close to someone at work and and what you don't understand is intimacy is a very, very important thing. It's, it's a matter, once you're married, who you decide to become intimate with. Listen to me carefully. Intimacy is the invitation to invite somebody to come in and to see something that should only be seen. It's, it's something that everybody shouldn't see. Come in to me and see. There are they're, they're, you don't let the whole world see some things, and then you have a circle you let people see, and then there's certain things that in a marriage that only you and your, your spouse should see, intimacy. And somebody says, well, you know, I just, I just feel comfortable talking to this person. You know, if you're a woman, you know, I, t I talk to this man. We're not doing anything wrong. We just go eat. It's the same lunch that everybody else. We're not doing anything. You know, what you're doing is you're letting them come into you and see something that should be reserved for your spouse to come in to see. Yeah, you know, some people call this emotional adultery. Isn't that right? Emotional adultery, it's where you have allowed intimacy to take place where it begins to impact you emotionally, and then you have a grudge against your spouse because you don't know why they're not responding to you that way, and you don't realize you've not ever allowed them that opportunity to be that intimate. You didn't let them in to see that. You let somebody else in to see that. And what happens is, you know, if you're not careful, then eventually it's going to end up into a physical relationship because that's what real intimacy is about. If you feel it's a safe place to talk to this person that you think it's safe to talk to them instead of your wife or your husband, then all of a sudden you become vulnerable around those people. And then once you become vulnerable around people, then real intimacy takes place. And sometimes real intimacy is more dangerous than a sexual encounter. 
because it involves your emotions. You let somebody else in. Your emotions are all tied to that kind of thing. That's the very thing we try to counsel people in marriage. We try to say to married people, there's got to be a safe place in order for there to be vulnerability. And then once you become vulnerable, then you enter into intimacy. And once you have real intimacy, you don't ever have to worry about the things that follow that because that becomes the springboard into all types of wonderful things where marriages are concerned. But sometimes people, you know, they neglect that whole deal and they decide, well, I want to I wanna go back and continue to talk. They don't recognize this is not good. You go back and you want to continue to talk to that person. Uh, you want to continue to tell them how you feel about something when your wife does this, when you need to be telling your wife how you feel about that. Nobody else needs to have the invitation to come in and see something about your wife. And then when your wife meets her, she knows more about how you feel about her than the wife does. That's, that's spelling trouble. And uh, the result of that is going to be an affair. It's going to be, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, because you allowed that to take place uh, and you've got to make sure that doesn't take place. You've got to rid yourself of that. You can go around and say, I've never committed adultery, I never had sex, and you think it's, I've never committed adultery, I never had sex, but it's something worse. You allowed yourself to develop a relationship with someone that you invited in to see something. And that's going to take you to places that you need to go. Well, we're just good friends. I told my wife when I got married, got married she had this guy. She said, we've been friends all y'all all your life. I said, I'm sorry. That, that, that's got to be over with. That's got to be over with because I don't want him knowing more about you than I know about you. And in them days, she used to wear these little cut-off shirts and these little short shorts. I said, no, you can't be hanging around, around him doing that. And I told him, I said, I don't feel comfortable with you hanging around here. I said, because you a dude, you a man. Don't be come talking about you ain't looking. <laughs> them big pretty legs and you ain't looking you lying yeah. where, you, where, you, where you been oh man when I y'all went out to well dinner ain't you dating me oh yeah but we friends oh we gonna have to change that <laughs> And, and my fear was, are you going to let him in to see something that you hadn't let me in to see? Intimacy. It's a strong, powerful thing. And if that has always been something that has caused problems in your relationship, don't go back to it. Make your mind up that there are certain things that are only going to be shared within the context of my marriage, my family, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, John 5, 14, let's focus in on this now. And he says, and finding him in the temple, Jesus said to him, you have been made well, stop sinning, so that nothing worse happens to you. In other words, your lifestyle didn't prevent your miracle. Obviously, he was sinning before that, or Jesus wouldn't have said, you got to, don't go back to it. So his sinning lifestyle didn't prevent his miracle. But if you don't live a new way, things are going to get worse, is what he says. Isn't that interesting? Your lifestyle didn't prevent your miracle, but if you keep going back, things are going to get worse. That, that's powerful to me. You, you can't say that, you know, whatever you were doing stopped your miracle. This guy was doing something and still got the miracle. And when he got the miracle and got whole, he was in church. And Jesus says, don't go back. Don't go back or you're going to cause something worse to happen. Now, somebody says, well, I thought I was under grace. Under grace, you got your miracle. But in the world, you're going to make stuff worse because sin has consequences. Like I said, grace is not going to give you an open opportunity to just go do stupid stuff. Stupid stuff in this world becomes a part of the law that says, while the earth remains, sin, time, and harvest. See, excuse me, sin, sin, time. That's about right. Seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. And so there are consequences. I mean, you know there's consequences for sin, right? There's consequences for sin. But it won't stop your miracle from Jesus. But there are consequences for sin. And I think people, they kind of, don't get that. Don't go back. 
If, if, if the mercy of God showed up and you didn't get the bad you deserve, thank God, show up at church and don't go back. <laughs> Amen. Be grateful. There were a plethora of things that could have happened to you that thank God because of his mercy, it didn't happen to you, and you ought to give God some praise for that and thank him that it didn't happen to you. It could have. It could have. You could have been dead, shot, beat up, all kinds of stuff. It didn't happen. Don't keep flirting around with your past. Never go back. Now, it's interesting to note here that Jesus is now controlling, or excuse me, he's, he's confronting this man about his sin. He never brought it up when he healed him. Not one time did he bring his sin up when he healed him because God wants us to understand that we cannot earn our healing through our holiness. We cannot earn our healing through our holiness. And, and so many people are trying to still earn what grace has made available through their behavior. You can't, he didn't earn his healing because he was holy. He earned his healing because he believed Jesus. And, and thank God we're, we're healed because we believe Jesus. We're delivered because we believe Jesus. We're blessed because we believe Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So I think that believers often feel that they cannot receive anything from God until they get all the sin out of their lives. And while I am not endorsing keeping the sin in your life, the two are often unrelated. Since Jesus told him to stop sinning after he healed him, then we can know that sinlessness is not a prerequisite to our healing. Belief is. Boy, I know that's rough for some people to hear. I mean, I've heard it a long time in my Christian life. The reason why you didn't get healed is because of the sin in your life. Jesus will help you to not go back. He'll help you to walk away from sin. He'll help you to walk away from some of the things that you struggle with in your life. He will do that. But that is not a prerequisite for any of the finished works of Jesus Christ. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Now, having said that, Jesus understands the law of seed time and harvest, and whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. So although the man's faith and action brought about the miraculous power of God in order to preserve his healing, he was going to have to change. He was going to have to change whatever he was doing that was opening the door to this previous 38-year condition. And I think a lot of times Christians need to understand that. You can get healed one day and walk right back through the door of what caused this thing, and it's right there again. And sometimes it can be natural things. It could be your diet. It could be your stress level. It could be the decisions you make. It can be all of those things. You understand? On a natural, practical sense, what are some things that you are doing that God made you whole from, and you recognize those doors that you've walked through to cause that situation, but you ignore them? You're ignoring them. You're not paying attention to them. And then you get in a box, and I have to come and bury you, and I'm not the kind of preacher that has searches for excuses for why you're in that box. I just go with what I know. You're saved and you're in heaven. I ain't talking about all the stuff you did because I don't know. I ain't lived with you. I don't know what you did. When I see you, it's praise the Lord, hop, hop, hallelujah. You're not telling me what you're eating, how stressed out you are, how many arguments you have, what your kid did, did they cuss you out the night before that, what, what hurt, what happened. I, you, I, you, I don't know none of that. But all I'm saying is you are not, you are not, please do not allow yourself to live in a life of distress and you don't have no room to take somebody's drum in to stress you out. The word of the Lord came to type of one woman, tend to your own business. I said, amen, because you ain't got room to be tending to somebody else's business. You only got room for your own stress. You ain't got room for all everybody else's stress. Don't do it, guys. I've seen so many people destroyed because they allow themselves to keep going back to the same stress. That's huge. That may be the number one killer. Don't do it. There's things you're supposed to do. Don't go back to the stress. Look at what you're eating. Don't become a slave to food. Push back on some stuff that you really want. Look at what you're smoking. 
Look at what you're drinking and how often you're drinking it. Pastor, you know who you're talking to? Yeah, I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> Value your peace. Receive the peace of God. Thank him for being whole. Every morning you get up and don't, don't have no worry, thank God that you woke up in peace. Go to bed in peace. Live in peace. And the God of peace will be with you. You know what peace means? It's, it's translated the same. It's the same word, wholeness. Be whole. Don't go back to the things that cause you to be broken. Don't go back to relationships that cause you to be broken. Your children grow up. Your parenting is over. So don't try to be the parent you were when they were 12. They're 35 now. It's a whole different relationship. You can't tell them what to do. They're 35. You can offer advice and back up. And the rest of the time, you pray. But you don't get mad and get strife because they didn't do what you recommended. I love you, baby. Keep living. But you ain't going to get on my nerve. Got to go now. Bye. Yeah, but I ain't finished the conversation. I don't want to talk about it no more. Bye. And then I use that anointed thing on the phone called block. <laughs> you know why y'all laughing, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm in your house now. Turn to two people and tell them, never go back. And that's a decision of quality. I believe that, that you have to make. You have to make that decision of quality. He never brought it back up. That was so, so awesome. So I think that believers often feel that they cannot receive anything from God until they get rid of the sin. I don't, I don't think that's correct. So having said that, Jesus understands these things. He understands all of those things that we talked about. So here's this guy in this previous condition, 38 years. And even though he was healed, Jesus wanted him to know that there was something worse than having that sickness. It's having the consequences of bad decisions in our lives. Having the consequences of bad decisions in our lives. If you pay attention, the Holy Spirit will help you. Is that a bad decision? You've done that before. How much, how many more times are you going to open yourself up into that? We see a significant change in this man's life who was healed by Jesus. And after being healed, where do we find this guy? After he was healed, he's in the temple. He's in the church. He's learning a new way of thinking and a new way of seeing himself. He's not hanging around with the same crowd or the same, uh, hanging around the same pool even. He's now in God's house. He's now identifying with that new life. And so he realized that the place to be was in the house of God where he could hear the life-changing word that would empower him to become a victor rather than a victim. And God has been so good to you. God was, has been so good to me. And you know what I say when God's been good to you? Now change. Now change. Use that goodness as motivation to go ahead and change. So what does this look like? What does this change look like practically? I'll give you these four things and I'll let you go. Number one, plant different seeds than the ones you've planted. I don't know whether the, the action was the seed. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about what, what kind of seed, what kind of attitude, what kind. Plant different things. Do different things than what you, 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 you've been planting before. Don't plant the same seeds of hate and discuss and all, plant different seeds than you, than you did before. This is what this change and never looking back practically looks like. Number two, develop new relationships with people who will support and reinforce your change. Develop new relationship with people, people who will support and reinforce your change. Don't keep hanging around with the same old dude who calls the same old thing all the time. Sometimes you, watch this, sometimes you gotta cut, cut some, you gotta cut some relationship. You gotta recognize when you're in a toxic relationship. Here's the first thing you can recognize in a toxic relationship. 
when people are taking advantage of you rather than giving the advantage to you, that's a sign it's a toxic relationship. They're not really interested in giving you the advantage. They're only interested in how they can take advantage from you. It's a toxic relationship. And for whatever reason that you feel like you want to stay stuck when all of the signs are indicating this is just not a good relationship for me, now, now you're, you're questioning your value. You're questioning how you see yourself. I mean, how is it that you can remain in a situation where somebody abuses you emotionally, abuses you physically, they're not concerned about giving you the advantage ever, and you want to stand the emotions, you want to stay in a relationship because you like the way somebody look? No, I, I, I'd rather be with somebody that don't look too good, but they're good for me. Because, listen to me, when intimacy takes place, they're going to look good to you. Amen. See, we got to get rid of that benefit motive. We got to find people that are going to build us up, that are going to reinforce who we are. Why would you want to marry somebody that doesn't believe in your Jesus? The only thing they're going to do is work overtime to try to get you to believe the way they believe. Find somebody, develop a relationship with people who will support and reinforce your change. Support and reinforce your change. Now, I know some of you look at me like, I ain't going to do it. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you one or two times, and <laughs> that's it. And when you get to heaven, I say, well, how was the last 10 years of your life? Pastor, it was hell. I said, you didn't do what I told you to do. Did no, I didn't. I should have. <laughs> Number three. I know this is going to be foreign. Get in the temple and learn to walk with God. It's like what you're doing tonight. Where, where's everybody else? You're in the temple learning how to walk with God. This is, this is the place where you come to learn how to walk with God. This is not the place we come to, to play church. It's not the place we come so we can do cartwheels and flips. And it's, it's the place where we come to learn how to walk with God. That's why we've been putting a lot of emphasis on relationship. Make that decision. Get in a temple. Get in this place where you learn to walk with God. And how are you going to ever be learning how to walk with God if I keep getting up and feeding you popcorn messages and, and, and playing church and all that kind of stuff? It's a level of information that has, needs to be shared, teaching and, and training that we got to share. And, and your life begins to change because you're here learning how to walk with God. And then the last one. Change the way you think, and you'll change the way you live. Change the way you think, and you will change the way you live. This was such a revelatory statement in my life where if I can change how I think, I change how I live because how I live is based on my thinking. What I expose myself to determines the way I think. What I expose myself to determines the way I think, and the way I think determines how I feel. But if I can change the way I think, I'll change how I feel. I'll change what I do. I'll change my actions. I will change my destination. If I can change the way I think. Don't you understand? That's the battleground. Everything about your life, it starts with Satan trying to influence you through some type of image, something he can expose you to. What can I expose you to that will impact your thinking? Or what, what, can, what can I keep you ignorant of that will impact your thinking? Because if you, can, if you can change your thinking, you change your life. That's what happens when you come to church. It's what happens when you come to Bible study. That's what happens when you're committed to a study of God's Word. It changes the way you think, and then your life changes. You're not thinking like that anymore. And when you change the way you think, you change the way you believe. And when you change the way you believe, because you change the way you think, because you're changing what you're exposing yourself to, man, your life changes. Your life changes, man. You do things differently. But it, start, it starts right here. It starts right here. And in your mind, never go back to that way of thinking. Never go back to that way of thinking. Now, I know you're human, and you might fall back into some things. Just don't stay there. Don't stay there. Definitely don't live there. If you have a bad day, make sure I ain't doing that today. <laughs> keep going. Keep pressing. Because your life's changed. Your thinking's changed. You have a relationship with God. All is well. 
you will change. You will be like this guy who started off making a bunch of excuses, but ended up in church. He started off making excuses, started off procrastinating, started off with no desire to change. But he ended up in church when he saw wholeness taking place in his life. Are you tired of going through the motions and never seeing results in your life? It's time to embrace the positive change God wants for you. The seven message series, Changed by Grace, is designed to help you finally see lasting results. For a love gift of $40 or more, you can receive the entire series. The most important thing a born again person do is to renew your mind. Why? So you can see Jesus. Every study time, I see him more. Every prayer time, I see him more. You're being transformed every time you see him more. And one day you're going to look at him and you're going to look just like him. Jesus provided everything I need. He died on the cross, so I, I would have everything that I need today. And I don't have to do anything but just believe. Or, for just $55, you can also receive a four-message series, New Depths in the Holy Spirit. In this series, you'll learn how to cultivate a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. Call today or visit the website below to order. I want you to look at your life, your family, your friendships, your job, your hobbies. Every single piece that makes up your life, God cares about it not just your Sunday morning life. He came that every piece would be good, that every single piece would be covered with his love, with his favor. That's what it's all about. It's about you understanding that he's involved in every piece. Yes, he gave you salvation, but this life, this grace life, it's about the whole thing. It's about your flourishing in every piece of your life, not just on Sunday morning because he's not just a Sunday morning kind of God. And I'm on a mission to show you how to take back the victory in all those pieces. How every single piece of your life is covered under this grace. So join me July 6th through the 10th for Grace Life 2020. Register now at CreploDollarMinistries.org. And remember, no peace left behind. One of the major goals of Creflo Dollar Global Missions is to help hurting people physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We like to take a practical approach to helping those in need in communities all over the world by assisting people directly, as well as supporting organizations that are on the ground changing lives. Visit CreploDollarMinistries.org today and see for yourself how your prayers and financial donations are at work in the lives of thousands. Whether it's through our main campus or fellowship churches, our international offices or mission trips, every day Creflo Dollar Global Missions makes a mark that cannot be erased. To learn more about the work of Creflo Dollar Global Missions, log on to missions.creflodollarministries.org. Thank you for your support. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe.